This video will contain spoilers for Jujutsu Kaisen chapters 120, 121, and 122, and season 2, episode 18, otherwise known as episode 42. <laughs> So, the second season of Jujutsu Kaisen is experiencing a moral quandary, and in this series, I'm going to be analyzing the story of the series as it airs and, as a manga reader, comparing the anime to the manga to see what they pulled over directly, what they modified or expanded, and what they just straight up removed. So let's begin with the 18th episode of Season 2 of Jujutsu Kaisen. First, I'll recap the plot and explain what chapters it covered. The episode begins with Nanami and his two-faced looking ass stumbling down a hallway, as we saw at the end of the previous episode. He stumbles past a photo booth, which the camera curiously lingers on, before the curtain pulls back to reveal Mahito in hiding, who takes notice of Nanami stumbling past and starts to follow. Nanami stumbles down a set of stairs and ends up in front of a horde of transfigured humans. He tilts his head back, his focus wavering and thinks about his plan to retire to a low-cost-of-living country like Malaysia. Though his mind wanders, and he thinks about how tired he is, he carves through the transfigured humans nonetheless. That is, until Mahito makes contact. Mahito offers to have a pleasant chat, but Nanami sees you, his old classmate, who points in a direction, causing Nanami to look that way, and see Yuji just arriving on the scene. Though he resists what he imagines you telling him to say, he still turns to look at Yuji anyway, telling him he has it from here. And Mahito ends him. Enraged, Yuji shouts at Mahito, who shouts right back. The battle begins as the Dual Soul Sorcerer and the Soul Manipulator Curse engage in hand-to-hand -hand combat. Mahito once again demonstrates a new ability he's picked up, although this time we get an explanation. Soul Multiplicity is an extension technique that allows Mahito to merge two or more souls together, whereas Body Repel is a use of that extension, exploiting the soul's rejection of each other alongside Mahito's injection of increased cursed energy to create an explosive reaction that Mahito can then direct at an enemy. This scuffle ends in Mahito giving Yuji a bitchin' scar across his face. He presses Mahito once again on his motives, but Mahito is beyond human understanding and decency. He stakes a claim that Yuji is just Mahito, which goes unexplained for now, and the two square up. Mahito plans to take advantage of Yuji's belief that he will continue transforming his limbs to attack, and instead plans to perform a simple stabbing attack with his fingers to pierce Yuji's heart like he thinks he's Wesker or something. Mahito makes his move, but only stabs the air where Yuji used to be. Yuji makes use of a martial arts technique known as Joint Release, where a combatant unlocks their knees to immediately fall to the ground without any starting movement. But Yuji also releases his hips and shoulders to position himself to attack from Mahito's feet before he has a chance to react. Yuji whips out a Taito Martial Arts Manji Kick to Mahito's face and presses the attack, but Mahito manages to transform his arm into a thorned whip and counterattack, pushing Yuji away. The two continue their battle through the station, with Mahito making use of delayed transfigurations to set traps for Yuji. Mahito shows off some more new moves, and Yuji takes note that he has more tricks up his sleeve this time around. Mahito plans to make use of transfigured humans as much as he is, not only to reduce risk to himself, but also to break Yuji's spirit. He engineers a situation with some randomly still alive humans nearby. Seriously, why are these dudes just chilling around here? Did they not notice all the crazy shit going on? Did they miss the fucking meteor hitting the ground outside or all the sound Skuna pinballing Mahuraga around and turning most of Shibuya into sashimi must have made? To further fuck with Yuji, but really just manages to piss him off more. That being said, Mahito says he has one more card up his sleeve as well, and we cut to a flashback. Back before the curses split up in their game to try and find Yuji first, Mahito unveiled he had another new ability, 
and split a clone of himself off from his main body. He sent his clone above ground while sticking underground himself. At the end of the flashback, we cut back to the clone, confronting Nobata on the street. She recognizes Mahito instantly as the one who's been plaguing Yuji, and calls on her memories from the fight with Esso and Kechizu to try and regain the feeling that let her land a black flash. The two engage in a brief scuffle, with Nobata landing hits on Mahito's clone, but he laughs it off as it can only deal superficial damage to him. Mahito assumes, based on what Nobata said, that she's friends with Yuji, and states his plan to bring her dead body before Yuji to break him further. And the episode ends. With the recap out of the way, let's go over the basic points of the plot. 1. Nanami is confronted by Mahito, with Yuji arriving just in time for Nanami to offer him some final words of encouragement, and we finally say so long to the seventh three sorcerer, as he joins the hallowed halls of other fallen mentors like Ben Kenobi and Rengoku Kyojuro. 2. Mahito and Yuji engage in their duel of the fates, with Mahito marking Yuji with a scar like the boy who lived, and making it clear part of his goal is to break Yuji's spirit as much as possible. 3. Mahito reveals the ability to split off into a clone, which he sends above ground. At the time the original Mahito is fighting Yuji, the clone confronts Nobata, intending to kill her to further break Yuji's spirit. Now let's get into some analysis. First, let's talk about Mahito's new skills. Clearly, he's been practicing, expanding the uses his technique has. Looking at soul multiplicity, we see as he's learned how to use his power to manipulate souls to attempt to force them to merge with one another. You could almost consider his ability to create a clone of himself the inversion of this ability, to split a piece of his own soul off and form a body around it. Of course, doing this with other souls leads to them rejecting the merger, perhaps due to some inherent incompatibility with each other. By injecting even more cursed energy into this reaction to pump it up, it effectively becomes an explosive rejection, which he then directs towards his target as an attack. You can imagine it almost like a Diet Coke and Mentos reaction, to reference a preview from a recent episode, but if you could pump more force into it to make it just blow the whole bottle up altogether, then throw that at somebody like some kind of kid-friendly Molotov cocktail. This relates back to the theory I talked about regarding Skuna and his inexplicable ability to use fire. If you caught the official subtitles on release for episode 17, last week's episode, you might have noticed a particular cooking theme regarding the names they used for Skuna's techniques. It has since been corrected to use the terms from the manga, which were not so obvious. The reason for this is due to the fact that some of the names of the abilities in Skuna's technique use Japanese words that can either be interpreted as cooking terms or that obliquely reference the part of a shrine where food is prepared, for example. It has been a long-standing theory in the community that Skuna's technique is related to cooking somehow, which of course would make his ability to use fire make perfect sense, as heat is a central aspect of cooking. Again, this is another thing that even people current on the manga have not gotten answer on as of yet. Connecting this to the theory I mentioned, some people have put stock in the idea that Skuna's deeper insight into Jujutsu and Cursed Energy due to his thousand-year existence allowed him to realize that you can expand your technique by way of interpretation, that growing your technique and skills involves focusing on the theme of your technique and stretching it to include other ideas that can be considered part of that theme. So if Skuna's technique is themed around cooking, he could stretch it to include fire as something he can conjure or manipulate as part of his technique. Further support for this theory can be seen if you look at other characters' techniques. For example, Megumi's Ten Shadows technique seems to be based around the Ten Shikigami primarily, but the word shadow is literally in the name, and shadows are used as the medium to summon the Shikigami. So he was able to stretch the interpretation of his technique to give him further control over the shadows themselves and use them as a storage space. If we look at Gojo's Limitless technique, you can see that over the years the members of his clan had already done a lot of work pushing the boundaries of what their technique could achieve. It's more than likely that initially, Early Limitless users only used the neutral application of Limitless to stop attacks from reaching them. 
Over time, they eventually started piecing together that their technique was actually manipulating the concept of infinity, and with that knowledge, expanded it to encompass the blue and red abilities, as well as directly imparting that concept onto their enemies with the unlimited void domain expansion. If we then applied this theory to Mahito, we could see how he's gained these new abilities he showcased by expanding the concept slash interpretation of his technique to not just manipulating the shape of a soul as it is, but also using that manipulation to merge them or split them into pieces as well. Of course, going back to the theory as I mentioned it in the video for episode 16, a cursed spirit will probably ultimately be more restricted in how freely it can interpret its technique in comparison to a human, so as creative as he can try to get, Mahito will still be restricted to ideas surrounding the narrower concept of soul manipulation, rather than something more broad like cooking, infinity, or shadows. Next, I'm going to do a little reflection on Nanami. Nothing super in-depth or anything, but I feel like it's pertinent to give him a little time to shine, given what happened in the episode. If Gojo is the pinnacle of the modern Jujutsu world, a guy who is super cool and doesn't afraid of anything, and is an example of a Nepo baby who is simply born with everything he has going for him, and Kusakabe is an example of a grade 1 sorcerer who has no technique and made his way to where he is practically on hard work, grit, and sweat alone, but still lives his life governed by a healthy amount of fear born from his acute awareness of his limits as a sorcerer, the Nanami showcases what a character at the midway point between Gojo and Kusakabe is like. He had a pretty strong technique, but didn't do a ton of work to expand it or find new uses for it, since he'd been able to handle anything he needed to with it just the way it was. His outlook was harshly realistic, always doing his best to remain objective and remind others of where their limits lie. That being said, he wasn't arrogant like Gojo, and so asked others to stay out of harm's way not so he could safely go all out without worrying about them, but more out of genuine concern for their well-being. Interestingly, you can see how Nanami developed a rougher exterior after the death of Yu, and how much that actually affected him. When he thought Ijichi was dead, he flashed back to Yu for just a second, and saw him again just before his death. Even asking people to bow out when he knew they were out of their league, like we saw him do with Nobata and Shibuya and Yuji in Season 1, probably originated from the fear of them ending up dying in a situation where they were in over their heads like Yu did. Yu's death probably played a large part in him deciding to leave the sorcerer life behind initially as well, to run away from it, as he put it, but ultimately he only found dissatisfaction in working as a salaryman to make the rich richer, and returned to being a sorcerer to feel like he was actually making a positive difference to people's lives. This highlights his caring nature and just how much he truly was concerned for the good of others. However, he knew from Yu's death the pain that could come from the loss of those you're close to, as Miwa pointed out so he tried to keep his distance from others for that reason. In his final moments, he thinks back to how he ran away and came back, mentioning that he finds his reasoning of finding the work worthwhile to be vague. He asks himself again why he came back, and that's when Yu points Yuji out to him. Personally, I interpret this moment to be Nanami's subconscious, or perhaps even Yu himself telling Nanami from beyond the grave that Yuji was his reason for coming back. Now, of course, Yuji wasn't even a sorcerer yet when he came back, so it wasn't Yuji in particular that brought Nanami back, but rather the feeling of his experience with Yu's death and the running away from the Jujutsu world that stemmed from it. He didn't want someone else to have to go through that like he did, and to experience the feeling of having lost his youth to it like he did. He thought that by coming back to the Jujutsu world, he could contribute and work to keep young sorcerers safe enough to protect them from having to go through what he did and prevent more people like you from dying too early. That's how I interpret that scene. His final line, of course, is the symbolic passing of the torch from the previous generation to the next. It's effectively the same as All Might pointing at Midoriya and telling him he's next. Of course, because Jujutsu is much harsher and darker of a story, Nanami had to die after saying that, instead of sticking around to continue teaching and mentoring young sorcerers. Finally, let's go over the bonus pages between these chapters and the volume release of the manga. After chapter 120, we get a page from Akutami addressing Gojo's technique, and how, with the airing of the anime, this volume came out in January 2021 in Japan, not long after the anime first premiered, he won't be able to half-ass his explanations of Gojo's technique any further.
After chapter 121, we get the first meeting of the consultant he brought on to go over Gojo's technique with him. And after chapter 122, we get an explanation that Mahoraga sent Skuna outside the curtain in their fight, but Akutami left that detail out of the drawing since it didn't really matter, which I believe the animation team just straight up omitted as well in the last episode. Probably for the same reason. And that's my episode recap and story analysis for the 18th episode of the second season of Jujutsu Kaisen. Make sure to subscribe and turn on bell notifications if you want to be here as soon as possible each week as I put out new videos for each episode as it airs, and feel free to drop a comment with suggestions as to other videos you might like to see such as character analysis videos or explanations. Thanks for watching.